Hello everyone, this is Joseph Porter, your host, and you're listening to The Next Layer. In this podcast, we're looking to explore the world of added manufacturing, from hobbyist applications to complex engineering solutions. Our focus is to not only learn about the current state of the market, but where it is going and how individuals like you and I can take part in these trends. We'll be interviewing hobbyists, engineers, and scientists, discussing new techniques, applications, technology, and discovering what the future of added manufacturing will entail. Whether you're an aspiring creator or a senior research scientist, we hope that you listening are able to learn something new. We'd like to thank our sponsor, MarketList.com, for making this episode possible. MarketList is an online contract bidding platform for ad manufacturing where local manufacturers have access to a wider range of work that they can bid on, and clients can receive offers that best fit the needs of their project. If you're interested in saving time and money on your next 3D printing project or taking on more clients for your business, stop by marketlist.com. The link is in the show notes. In today's episode, I have Daniel Costello on, who is a manufacturing engineer and also the owner of Costello Design and Consulting. In this episode, we talk about Daniel's career thus far, working with the Mythbusters teams on various projects, added manufacturing and casting in the jewelry industry, when to use 3D printing and casting versus making tooling, his hopes for the future of 3D printing, and the work he is doing right now with his design and consulting company. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy this episode. I've got Daniel Costello on here with me today. Uh, Daniel, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, Joe. How you doing? Uh, Yes, so I'm uh, just an all-around kind of maker. I've been, you know, whittling things out of wood and carving stuff since I was a kid, and, you know, everybody always said I should go to engineering school. Um, so, you know, once I graduated high school, I did, uh, and it turns out it was like purely math. It was like not, there was like very little building in school. And so, uh, I had a job there, um, while I was going to school at New Mexico tech, um, at, at a explosives test range that was connected with the school. So that was pretty neat. I got a lot of, uh, experience there with making stuff, designing stuff um just how stuff's done in the field uh tons of really crazy stuff got to do some cool mythbuster projects um stuff like that but you know i always just like really like making stuff you know just having like you know an idea pop in your head and you're like oh my god like we have to make this you know and so um that's you know that's kind of where my passion comes from um it's just you know, just making stuff out of whatever material, wood, metal, leather. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, once I graduated school, um, got a job, moved out to Houston. And, you know, the job was pretty cool. But, you know, I I think on the side I was, you know, working on motorcycles and, you know, building motorcycles, working on my truck, doing stuff like that, kind of getting into the stuff that I really wanted to be doing um you know in my in my personal life but you know not so much in my um you know in my professional life and uh, i ended up uh me well i guess reconnecting with uh, a friend and kind of started dating i moved back to albuquerque and um you know i guess i started uh well I guess I did a little side side stint for a hot rod company and it was cool. I mean, they would, you know, they do some really impressive projects and things like that. But, um, uh, I think it was kind of short lived. It's kind of interesting. The, the engineering aspect versus like the one off aspect. Um, you know, I don't think they were quite prepared for, you know, an upfront of like 20 or, 40 hours of somebody just designing something to make it perfect. And then, um, you know, they're just like, ah, oh, just get it going, just put it on there. Um, so uh, I think once things really started to click was when I started working as a, uh, as a field service engineer at Rio Grande. It's a uh, jewelry, jewelry distribution, jewelry manufacturing company out of Albuquerque. Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, it's pretty neat. They do the the facility is crazy. It's it's this huge facility, um, and basically half of its half of its warehouse and distribution, and the other half is 
um, just purely manufacturing for jewelry goods and uh, um, jewelry accessories and tools. And, you know, my specialty was um, the casting machines that were designed there, you know, 20 years ago, and they had been making them ever since. And so that was pretty neat. There was a lot of design work um, associated with that. And so, you know, kind of things just started to click for me. You know, I really loved it. And then, you know, also, once again, just being exposed to these casting machines, which, you know, once I realized that with these casting machines, you can make pretty much any shape that you want, um, you know, things just really started to click for me. And then, you know, compared, um, you know, getting a uh, couple that with uh, 3D printing, you know, these uh, castable resin uh, materials that they have. And, you know, you can pretty much print, you know, there's, there's little, there's small limitations on what you can do as far as printing and stuff like that. So, you know, once you marry those two, it was just like, oh man, this is so cool. So, you know, I was really mm -hmm. getting into that. Um, but, you know, a lot of their, their equipment there, I can't really, you know, use for a whole lot of the stuff that I wanted to do. All the, you know, like I said earlier, all those ideas that just pop in your head and you're like, mm -hmm. oh my goodness, you, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, uh, and then also we kind of had some, ex I had some uh, experience. I um, was part of a project to completely redesign one of the casting machines. And uh, it was just, it was just a huge project, you know, more than um, anybody had ever undertaken there. And um, especially there was only a couple of us on it. And just the amount of work we completely underestimated. And we were you know, months behind and trying to figure out how to get, you know, parts quickly. Cause you know, once you finally get the design, it's like, all right, cool. Now wait uh, 12 weeks for your parts to come in. It's like, oh man, now we're even further behind. Um, so that's when I kind of started like experimenting in like PLA casting um, and, you know, like larger scale, you know, a lot, Rio Grande does a lot of uh, casting for, off of sla prints which are smaller really? that's cool. uh, yeah 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 so that's kind of what you know that's kind of what i was used to is smaller stuff for jewelry but you know i'm a mechanical engineer so i like designing you know brackets and this and levers and you know whatever it is and so um so yeah you know i've had an fdm printer since way back so i started experimenting with pla casting and it, you know it just the results were kind of stunning you're like oh my goodness this is this is actually really great like how come more people aren't doing this and you know even some of the larger foundries that we were having parts made through you know they didn't want to do that kind of stuff um and so you know i just kind of i just kind of kept going with that and just um you know taking stuff uh, you know, I'd have people come to me and just like, well, I have this weird part that needs an adapter for this to this. And it, and it's like, oh, cool. Yeah. We'll just design it, 3d print it, print it and cast it now. So, wow. okay. um, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of really cool. I, I love, uh, you know, just getting those, you know, super quick results just cause, you know, designing stuff takes such little time printing it. It's pretty much hands off, you know, you just got to set it up and then, you know, casting almost the same thing. So, mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm at right now is, uh, just trying to, um, enable other people with their ideas and, you know, something they have kind of an idea, but they don't quite know how it's going to work or how to, how to actually get it into the physical world or even the 3d world for that matter. A lot of times, Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so yeah yeah that's that's kind of where uh um you know where i come in and kind of where like i said where i'm sitting now that's awesome so yeah i kind of want to pack some of the stuff that you dove into right there so did you say you previously worked on mythbusters projects yeah yeah um so what does what does that mean because you, you also you work for a like a explosives range or 
<laughs> yeah, I know. It's yeah. just kind of so, we kind of glossed over that. Just whoa, 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 yeah, whoa, whoa, whoa. you're yeah. gonna have to back up on that one. Yeah. yeah, no, yeah, it was a um, it was a explosives test range. I think it was like mm, I want to say it was like 42 square miles or something. There's if if you ever drive through Socorro, New Mexico, um, uh, don't stop, uh, but uh, just. <laughs> Just keep going, but yeah, no, I'm just kidding. It's a nice town. With, you know, you get close to the college. There's some, you know, really great places over there. But if you look, there's a mountain that has an M on it, and that whole mountain is surrounded by an explosives test range. Um, and so that's kind of what I was going to school for too. Was uh, was I have I have enough credits to have a minor, and I was going to go for a master's in explosives, but. Uh, as much as working there was a really cool experience, I just kind of got like the thing for me that kind of drove me away was that I I started realizing that like most of the practical applications for explosives are mostly around like more efficiently killing people, mm. um, which, you know, I, I don't agree with at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you know, we'd take, you know, bundles and bundles of uh plywood and just blow it up and it's like oh my goodness like we could be building houses with this stuff you know we could be instead mm -hmm. of blowing up their houses we could be building them houses but so um yeah i mean they do a lot of really cool stuff up there though at the explosives test range um and the cool part was that uh they had they would have like they would always have like these weird like uh, tv crews come in and like film these shows and it was always the tv crews were like the most fun projects because they were like well we want to like uh one was like this uh they wanted to like debunk all these myths about the world trade center like uh you know conspiracy theories so they'd be going on about you know about how to like recreate these crazy you know um conspiracy theories and stuff like that and you're like uh okay uh we're gonna have to figure that one out but uh but yeah the mythbusters came on and we did uh if you look up the rocket sleds there's a few like mythbusters rocket sleds where we did like uh cars like we put cars on rocket sleds and uh a whole bunch of stuff like that and just send them like you know 300 miles an hour down a track into something else um whoa yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah it was pretty cool so those those were like by far my favorite ones Amazing, um yeah. So but yeah was, the team yeah 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 we got to meet uh, i think um adam and jamie came out one time and then the other times it was just uh grant uh tori and uh, uh oh boy this is, i'm losing points right now um <laughs> i'm having a hard time too it's been a while since i've watched mythbusters honestly yeah 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 i grew up yeah but yeah it, but yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah they're all really years, cool. so. yeah they're yeah. all really cool people so it was super fun to work with them That's um so cool. yeah 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 so give those give those a good watch those will yeah those are uh really awesome uh footage of just and those rocket sled tests are my favorites too because you know, an explosion will last a split second, but those rocket sled tests at least last like a second. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah, a little yeah. more to savor. That's so cool. Okay, yeah, that's awesome. It, it was, we're able to work with the MythBusters team and get to meet meet their crew. I feel like so many people, and especially in the maker world, you know, you grow up watching MythBusters and their cool shop that they just got to build whatever the heck they wanted. You know, uh, oh, I know. Rest in peace to Grant. Uh, what a great guy. It's yeah, so I know. It was so crazy. I yeah, that was yeah. that was really terrible. I mm -hmm. I saw like something uh, like I don't know, like when I first saw it I was like I don't know. It's just kind of like one of those disbelief Shopping, kind of right? things that you're yeah. like, wait yeah. a second, wait. This like the like Grant, like am I this isn't the right guy. Like this is a right. different guy. And I'm like, yeah. wait, no, this is the Yeah, that was yeah, pretty pretty upsetting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super brilliant guy. Mhm. Mm but yeah, if you ever watch those uh, MythBusters where they're like in the bunkers, like the reaction shots and stuff like that, where it mm -hmm. shows like whatever blowing up, and yeah, I'm like on the back side of the camera. <laughs> oh no way! That's so yeah. cool. Wow. Okay. Yeah. 
was uh, Jamie and Adam and the crew, were they just like they were in the show or is there anything different, you know, between the show and, uh, and just- Yeah, they were all general? complete a-holes, total divas. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, they were, they were super nice, super cool. <laughs> always just joking around and super loose and you know yeah it was fun that's so cool what a, what a fun job that's i, I would have loved the job at the mythbusters man that'd have been, that'd have been oh i through. know yes that would be yeah like you were saying in their shop of just like well we have to make like our, the one that always comes to mind for like the crazy oh well and i don't even think it's that crazy it's just really neat was the one with the, where they were like trying to make the bridge rock back and forth with the and they got like, he had like, I don't even know how many pneumatic actuators to like go to one side and then the other with like boots on. It's just like, oh man, that's such a cool, like, yeah. oh, oh, where do you yes. even come up with that? Yeah, yeah. yeah to make uh, like, I, like the bridge was like swaying because of like mm -hmm. the harmonic uh, um, mm -hmm. frequencies and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful so. stuff. Yeah. Great memories of watching all of those growing up. Um, so then with jewelry making, um, so working with Rio Grande and uh, being their field engineer, but also working in their casting industry. And you said that they use uh, 3D printing quite a bit early on. Uh, were they kind of like early adopters of, because what, outer manufacturing has been around for a while, obviously, you know, since the 80s and whatnot. Uh, but for commercial or like more uh, consumer use, it hasn't been around that long. So do they have like uh, just kind of your, your casual FDM printers or did they have like their own industrial style ones or um i guess what, what would they use there um yeah so they would uh actually starting well actually i can't say starting out because i i hadn't been around that much but I, I will say early on probably the first machines that they had were uh dws and um which are they're really impressive machines um and i think for the day you know this is back like 2012 when dws was coming out with a lot of their wax uh you know castable style um uh you know resins and things like that it's a sla printer is what the dws is um they have crazy good um surface finish you know super super low um layer thicknesses so you can get just like an incredible print just right out the gate mm -hmm. with almost no finishing um so that's kind of what they've kind of started out in was those. Um, and I think the problem kind of with those, what they ran into, um, I, you know, it was just, I think, like I said, at first they were kind of top of their market and then all these like B9 started coming out with like a really super high, um, uh, super high resolution printers but then on top of that you know instead of uh you know 65,000 for the mid-size printer you know b9 is probably like 10,000 or something like that and their you know their resins aren't as expensive and their um trays last longer and you know the you don't you know you don't need a computer a standalone computer just to run the 3d printer and so there's a lot of aspects that you know, I think early on DWS kind of got their foot in the door, but then, you know, the little guys that, you know, that their, their, their print quality and their resolution wasn't quite as much, you know, but it was 90% there. And then, you know, their price tag was 10% of what they were. I think that's kind of what started happening with uh, DWS and the jewelry printing world. You know, DWS is still big in the manufacturing world, but I think, um, uh, you know they've kind of kind of shrunk in the jewelry arena um just to some of these other places like b9 and form labs are kind of the bigger ones mm -hmm. um and, and actually they had a really cool one there for a minute uh was the autodesk ember um uh rio grande was selling the autodesk ember for a while until they just like abruptly stopped selling them um but those ones were really neat. And uh, I actually have one of those and it's a pretty good little printer. If you have uh, really small parts, it's, it's a really great, super fast printer. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, but they just, they use a lot of uh, castable resins. Um, 
And, you know, honestly, they did a lot more um, reselling of, of these machines more so than they would do um, actual, you know, casted materials. And they used to do them like once in a while here and there. Um, but uh, for demos and things like that. But uh, it was kind of surprising that, you know, they didn't do more of it. And, um, uh, you know, when I was leaving, I've, you know, I just recently left there a couple months ago. Um, they were starting to pick up and do more of that kind of stuff, you know, using those castable resins and things like that. And I think, you know, there's, um, there's been big advances in those castable resins as well, you know, um, so you don't have to spend so much time finishing and, you know, grinding out porosity and things like that. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's, I think that's kind of one thing that's also enabled them to kind of bring that to the, you know, back in. Um, but yeah, no, actually they, um, no FDM. I, I would use my FDM printer uh for things that were like too big for any of the printers that we had over there so i would just use my printer and then bring the prints in if we were going to do anything like that so um but yeah i was i would always try and get them to uh to buy one but it was you know it's just kind of one of those things that you're like eh, it, they have a they have a full-on machine shop there you know cnc um uh they have like you know cnc mills cnc lathes all of the um uh, edm machines and everything like that so you know when you can make pretty much anything you want to and you're like hey let's get a 3d printer everybody's like mm, mm, no we'll just machine yeah. it <laughs> so um I say there's, kind there of are awesome. some machinists out there that can just literally uh, you know i was working at Brooklyn national lab over in long island as a research intern guy uh and they had this machinist, like literally, you say, hey, I want this part. And it was for some sort of aqua setup. So it had to be like super, you know, uh, well-made, you know, well-finished and all that stuff. And he said, I just want this. You didn't have to say dimensions hardly. You just, you just be able to like look at, a, look at it where you kind of approximately need to point out a few different things. You take a block of aluminum and the next day on your desk, uh, before you got to work, there would just be like a perfectly finished part that I don't even know how he made it. Um, oh but my goodness. yeah, it's just these, this pocket guru in this, you know, little mini you know, machine shop up in the corner of this lab. I was, I was always thoroughly impressed, uh, yeah. by sometimes what people can do in that. So, Hey, yeah, those are, <laughs> yeah. those are always the best. Like as a person, as a person who makes stuff mm -hmm. and like, I can tell like every detail of how something's made. The stuff that you like have no idea how it's made. It's just like, <laughs> like yeah. I'll, I probably spent uh, probably a good fifteen or twenty minutes looking at this wrench for the tub strainer <laughs> that I got from Lowe's. That I was just like, how the heck did they make? This? <laughs> so yeah, just those. I know exactly what you mean. Those parts that are just like, whoa, what happened yeah, here? Like, like, that's impressive. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I, I, I get it. Yeah, some, some people have a hard time, you know, kind of diving into 3D printing. But um, as you know, and as you're diving into, especially with your work, uh, so design and consulting, right? And yep. um, so let's let's dive into that a bit then with uh, your SLA casting. Because you so you kind of learned and picked up some of these skills back at Rio Grande, right? And then you're yeah, like, yeah, wow, totally. this is really cool. Um, and so you dive into it. So let, let's talk about that. Like what, what does, for those who maybe listen that aren't familiar with 3D printing, um, which I know we have a few of, for all of those people, what does SLA casting mean from like start to finish? And why, why is that uh, useful in the world of manufacturing? Yeah, so actually I do, I do two types. I do SLA uh, casting and I also do FDM casting. And, um, and so basically what that means is, yeah, you use a SLA printer, which gives you a, you use a special castable resin. Um, and so the SLA is more for smaller, real fine surface finish parts like jewelry parts, um, you know, jewelry, luxury goods, belt buckles, things like that you know, stuff, stuff more for aesthetics. 
Um, and so, uh, and, and then I guess the process is kind of the same for the FDM printing. Um, pr people are probably a little bit more familiar with FDM printing where they just, you know, heat up a piece of plastic and squirt it out a nozzle <laughs> um, layer by layer. So, um, yeah, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, I use that for a lot more of the low resolution kind of industrial stuff that really doesn't make a difference you know, what, you know, the outside looks like or the inside looks like or, um, and so, yeah, there's a special casting, castable um, filaments that you can print with. So I use those for like any larger parts or lower resolution parts. But then from there, so you take the print and, uh, and then the investment casting process is kind of a, it's kind of an involved process, but essentially what you do is you take whatever part you you want made and you um, connect it to a wax rod and um, and this this rod is kind of like a tree is what we call it in the in the business so that's kind of your center point for where you'll eventually pour your metal and so it's just basically the pathway into your part and um, so yeah, you, you use wax and you build this tree and, you know, if you want to put several models on it, you know, that's, that's kind of the beauty of it is, um, you know, print several models and put several of them on there. You can get a bunch of parts out of one cast. And so you've got a tree made out of wax. And then what you do is you put it in a, you surround it in a metal cylinder it's kind of perforated on the outside to allow airflow and you fill that cylinder with um, a plaster like material that's called investment and then so once you pour the investment and let it harden then you've got a, a cylinder with your wax tree and 3d printed parts on the inside and surrounded by plaster and then supported by this metal you know this metal cylinder and you take all that whole thing and you burn out all of the wax and the plastic. And, and then from there you have an empty cavity, which you can then, um, that becomes your mold for pouring the molten metal into. And then, so from there you can take that, that, uh, that well, we call it a flask is what the, what the whole, you know, um, cylinder and plaster and everything is called. So you take that burned out flask you stick that in your casting machine, you melt the metal and dump it in there. And then next thing you know, you've got a metal part that's the shape of whatever the plastic was that you put in there. I want to probably, that's awesome. That's such a cool process. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, did, yeah, I'm like, did I lose you there? <laughs> no, no, yeah, I'm just, following, yeah. I'm just <laughs> listening to soaking it in. Cause like, this is an area that I'm not, you know, super familiar with. I've, I've seen people do some aluminum casting in the past uh, just to make like ingots and whatnot. Uh, back in college but you know to, to hear what it's kind of like to actually like make functional parts you know it's a pretty fascinating process yeah yeah it's super involved and that's what um yeah too bad there's not a q a section for our listeners because i'm sure there'll be lots of questions and lots of huh but yeah, yeah i mean yeah. there's uh yeah it's it's a it's you know there's uh you know there's tons of equipment involved and there's you know multi steps and it's it's pretty involved but it's kind of neat because it can happen all in a really short amount of time and that's kind of where um you know where i really like to leverage things is like you know people will come to me wanting you know a certain part you know a blower for their uh forge or something like that one of my buddies does a lot of blacksmithing and then it's like oh cool yeah well you know take take a couple hours to design it print it cast it you know, all within the span of a week, you know, in the spare time. So, um, you know, it's a pretty involved process, but it actually goes pretty fast, especially when you do 3D printing. Um, so. I think the relative to the, the other version of that, which is making all the tooling, right? Where I'm not totally familiar with this process either, but from the little I know, right, you have to, uh, to make tooling is quite the expensive and expensive process, or at least it can be to make even some simple parts, right? Oh, completely. Yeah, it's crazy. And that's kind of where, you know, I, I touched on earlier that I was, uh, you know, doing this project where we were just like, you know, 
super far behind. And, you know, that was part of the problem was, you know, not only do you, so part of the, part of the issue with tooling too, is that, okay, so you've built this like really cool CAD model and it's like, all right, great. Well, in order to be able to like sand cast that, you have to have, you know, clear parting lines and stuff like that. So if it's, you know, if you've got like straight cylinders or something that you want to cast, you know, you've got to go in there and actually add, you know, a one or two degree draft on all of your CAD, you know, all of your surfaces, anything like that, or actually a square would be a better, you know, a better example. If you had a square that you wanted to cast, you know, you'd have to go in there and edit, you know, four sides of that square to have a draft on it to be able to um, actually pull it out of the, you know, the pattern. And then, so that's part of the pattern making process is just getting that. And then, um, and then building the pattern. And then the people at the foundry, you know, the people that build the, the pattern may not be the ones that are casting it. So then the people that are casting it are going to be the ones that want to do all the other gating and, you know, gating is where the metals poured into. So the people at the foundry are going to be the ones to do that. And, you know, every step of the way, you're looking at costs and extra lead time. And it's just like, oh, my goodness. Like, <laughs> oh. And mm. then so, you know, that was kind of the experience. And it was one of those. I had a couple of parts that I'm like, I'm pretty positive I can just 3D print and cast these. And um, nobody really seemed interested. Um, so I was just like, oh, okay. Well, you know, mm. <laughs> I tried. But, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. but then, so, you know, I just started doing that on my own, um, for that kind of thing. And then, so the really great part, um, you know, where you end up saving yourself a ton of money is one of the parts that we had, um, you know, I had overlooked a, you know, uh, a reaction force in this whole model. And then, so when we get this thing together, it turns out that you know once force was applied it kind of rocked in a in a way that we didn't want it to it's like oh well now all of your tooling's been made to make these parts right so now you have to like redesign the part send it back to the pattern maker and then the pattern maker has to like remake those patterns you know salvage what they can of the of the existing pattern and then mm -hmm. send it back to the foundry, regate the <laughs> regate the pattern, and have them repour it and everything. And it's Simple process. It's such a crazy process that really, I mean, that's you know, that's the beauty of doing it. Um, investment casting is you can you know you can get a run of five parts really inexpensively, and then if you want to make ten thousand of them, then yeah, you should absolutely make the tooling for it. But you know, you don't want to spend. 80 grand up front on tooling when you haven't even proven out that your product's going to work. Exactly. And that's, what I think so. a lot of people never realize too, is how long it takes to get, I mean, some people, I guess, if you spend tons of time and you have a ton of money, you can get that one shot product, right? Right off the bat. Yes. But that is a super huge process behind all that and lots of checks. But if you're trying to move fast, or even just trying to move at a regular pace, like it, rapid prototyping is super, super useful. Like, a, oh yeah, yeah. I did this. Uh, we had this one thing at a place I worked, and we need some support equipment, um, and just to make this test work. And uh, there was no way, like, a, normally, right? You'd I'd have to make a design somehow, or go through a mechanical designer, then go over to a machine shop, and maybe in twelve weeks I'll have the part. Um, and hopefully I had nothing wrong with the design in the first place or nothing changed in the experiment. Right. So I was like, uh, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I just went home, uh, you know, printed off a part, uh, brought it back in and made it work. And my boss was like, wait, what, how, how'd you make that work? So I was like, Hey, you know, 3D printing. And it's like, Oh, okay. It's this, it's this, this beauty how much faster you can go, um, to get parts done with 3D printing and rapid prototyping and stuff. And so this whole world, you know, I never really, uh, I've, I've seen stuff about it with uh, uh, the different casting, but it's really cool to hear uh, from you about how fast it is to, to make out metal parts, right? Because like, because with FDM, you know, it's one of the big cries of the limits is um, obviously, and I talked about this in a previous episode, was that it has kind of like, uh, it, it peels, right? So if you put force in the wrong direction, it'll start peeling on you or the plastic oh, is yeah. strong enough and whatnot. So when you do need that metal, right? Unless you want to buy a huge metal 3D printer, which which who knows how much it costs. And then, 
you know, and all that whole process. It's much, it's, it's nice to hear there is methods for going in and getting that, uh, those parts. I think you also yeah. have a great point too. Um, that's like when you're ready for those 10,000 parts, right? That's when you go to like the tooling, you know, and stuff like that. But if you want to move fast in the first place and just kind of get to market, um, with the concept or at least get to the stage where you're getting ready to go to market, rapid prototyping is huge. And that's where like services like you come in and that's just awesome that you're able to do that uh, for people and just get those parts out. Even for, especially for small batch stuff where you don't necessarily want to do tooling either. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's, uh, yeah, no, that's, that's kind of where, you know, the, the, the niche that I like to be in is just that, you know, Hey, you have a great idea. Like, I love this idea. Here's what we can tweak to make this work. And like, let's send it, you know, just mm -hmm. get it out there. So, um, yeah, absolutely. So what's, I guess on this topic, then what is like the craziest or what's, what's the most fun project that you had, uh, doing this kind of casting? Oh man, I don't know. Let me think about that. There's, um, there's been a few like hollow passages. Like I, um, I really like artistic things. There's been, um, uh, uh, a company, I don't want to share too much details, but it's kind of a, kind of a startup company that they, they do some like, uh, uh, some really artistic stuff, but they're, it's like hollow passages and like swirls and stuff like that. That's just like incredible. And you would, so this is the kind of thing, this is like kind of the other half of, you know, the capabilities of casting and 3D printing is that um, something like this part that has swirling hollow passages in it would not be able to be machined like ever, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah with 3d printing and casting you know you're able to do hollow passages curved passages um lattice structures i'm super into mm. lattice structures um you know doing like i'm sure uh there's like the brake pedal you know brake pedal that's latticed out in the middle for lightweight mm. and mm. uh or what was the one I think that, like Gotti I, you know, was working on a brake pad one time too that they have kind of like maybe yeah. I'm wrong, somebody, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, I think it's like it's it's like forty percent lighter or something like that because they three D print them, um, and they're just these awesome new brake pads, and it'd only be possible with like three D printing. Yeah, exactly. That's the kind of stuff. Um, yeah, in fact, I just did. Um, that was one of my more recent pieces. Is uh, just kind of a personal project. Uh, was uh, I. I get into a lot of the generative design stuff and I've got a, or it's, it's my wife's car, but it's a 71 Volkswagen Beetle. And, uh, you know, the shifter on there is just like a plain plastic, like dingy knob. And, uh, I was like, Oh man, we can do better than this. So I, um, you know, I generatively designed this, this shift knob. So that way it's hollow in the center, but it's kind of got like this double helix, like swirl, on the inside and um and yeah it's it's really cool looking part and so you know once again one one of those things that could only be created with additive manufacturing mm -hmm. but then you know uh, as you were saying uh these companies that have you know direct you know metal laser sintering and stuff like that you know the price and the you know, the facility that you need to support those is just astronomical at this point. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to get into it, but, uh, but, you know, the fact is I can, you know, I can make that same part for, you know, in the hundreds of dollars, you know, instead of like the thousands of dollars, mm -hmm. you know, in the low hundreds, you know, depending on even the volume as the volume goes up, um, as I was saying before, if you can stuff more parts in a flask, hey, you're getting, you know, those are, that's bonus cash right there. Yeah, so yeah, you're, there you you're saving, you're saving the more you can uh, stuff in a flask. So mm -hmm. that's super cool. And that's, a, I think, a major point that you highlighted that is often kind of glossed over with 3D printing and why people sometimes I think are always like, why 3D printing? Uh, people don't know about it. It's just the crazy things that you can do these days uh, with right. 3D printer, especially with like, SLA uh, printers and whatnot. Um, yeah, like the structure you're talking about. I mean, these things are just not, I mean, you know, it would, it would take a lot of effort, a lot of work to make these things work outside of 3D printing. 
And the beauty is oh, you, can yeah. just, you can make them so quick. Um, I just yeah, know no. those innovations oh, are yeah. going to come out in the next few years, you know, with regards to 3D printing. Totally. Yeah, no, I, I mean, that's, that's one of the cool things. Like once I started realizing that kind of stuff, I'm like, wait, like I can do, I can do this. Like, oh mm-hmm. man, like, oh, and, and it's even cool to see it kind of catching on too. When I was, when I was at Rio Grande, uh, there was a really awesome machinist there. Um, super young guy and kind of one of those same deals that you're like hey i'm kind of thinking this and he's like oh yeah we're gonna need this and you know next thing you know it's it's happening Mm -hmm. um but he was a machinist and so but he he would knew he knew that i would 3d print stuff so then one day he just sends me a file and's like hey uh uh, can you 3d print this for me i'm like oh yeah sure and it was just like this cover for this little machine that they these little machines that make the earring wire and uh and it you know it bends the hoop and cuts off the extra well when it cuts off the extra it kind of flings it straight into the operator's eyeballs Mm. and so um (laughs) normally they just put like a rag on it and then you know those parts kind of fling into the rag and just make a mess of the table and so he had come up with this like once again like and if you were going to machine it, it would be like, oh, my goodness, like the machinist would just be like, who designed this part? Like, give me a break, buddy. Like, there's so much. <laughs> there's nothing to grab onto. There's, you know, and uh, and he just sent it to me and he's like, hey, man, can you cast or can you print this for me? And oh, yeah, sure. How many do you want? And, oh, yeah. Well, I can fit, you know, I can fit 16 of these on a build platform. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, you know, two hours later, we've got these little these sweet little covers that have, you know, they're like radius on one side to match the contour and they have like a little relief on the inside for this and like a little grip on the outside so they can open it up and, you know, a little slot for a magnet. And, you know, so it's really cool to like, once you kind of expose people to it and they're like, Oh no, no. Like, Oh, you, Oh, like I can do this, you know, just kind of that freedom that it gives Mm -hmm. you, you know, in your design and, um you know i i love seeing that happen too it's just like wait i can do pretty much anything yeah it really just so. opens up design in general and i guess like so so on that topic then uh what are i guess with the way the market's kind of going and people are innovating all the time on this stuff what are you hoping to see in the market oh man i'm hoping to see supportless i'm i'm hoping to see an end to supports god dang <laughs> if we can get rid of supports <laughs> Yeah. I, I'm probably the first person to ever think of this, but we have to get rid of support. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned it. It's just one of those things, right? It's like when people get exposed to it, like, wait, I can do this. Like thinking about uh, like a, a world without supports. Oh my goodness. I can't. That would yes. be uh, wow. I can do literally anything then. If, yes. Yeah, if no, supports. totally. I mean, yeah, even that, even that shift handle that was like, you know, and I'll, I'll be honest, I go, I, I hate, I hate doing supports and I try and go as chintzy <laughs> on supports as I can. <laughs> and most of the time it works out <laughs> about 10% of the time I got to go back and reprint it with more supports. But, um, even then, oh man, it's just such a pain. And then the surface finish doesn't come out quite right. And so, yeah, the support free, that's, that's my vote on what needs to happen. <laughs> in the uh in the 3d printing world um as far as uh i guess it's kind of interesting because i'm in as as far as what the market's doing you know i'm kind of in two different realms you know i kind of dabble a little bit in the jewelry industry um just because you know the type of equipment that i i work with is um really conducive to that um so as far as the jewelry industry is concerned um personalization that's kind of like the big thing there is just like hey you want to uh you want a market list uh you know team rings for uh for you and you know the guys on your team oh okay cool well you know we'll do five of these special run rings but um you know it's not going to be um you know it's not going to be a big to do to make these custom rings you know because we just print them it's not like we have to sit there and carve five of them out of wax like we used to Mm -hmm. um and then uh 
So that's kind of one of the things that's kind of, you know, there, I, there's going to be a lot more personalization. You're going to see um, a lot more uh, accessibility to that personalization just from, you know, anybody off the street, you know, somebody who wants a special engagement ring for their, uh, mm-hmm. you know, for their significant other, um, you know, they can, they can have that access now at a much lower cost than they would have before. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, you know, from, from the industrial standpoint, um, uh, I think, you know, there's a lot more applications um you know generative design is kind of one of those big ones that's kind of growing right now um for lightweight you know lightweighting components you had mentioned that bugatti Mm -hmm. um brake rotor or the yeah yeah or the caliper the brake caliper Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and uh you know that kind of stuff so that's you know it's going to really enable uh that kind of stuff to happen and you know i'm pretty excited about that as you know kind of touched on that earlier about doing stuff for cars, you know, I'm super into cars and, you know, just sometimes in those, you know, super clutch applications, you know, for racing and things like that, every ounce counts. And so, you know, if you can Mm -hmm. lattice out and generative design out all that material topology optimization, you know, Mm -hmm. where you, where you only put material where the force is, um, where the force is there, you know, that kind of thing, um, you know, that's going to be a huge help. And even, you know, travel, aviation, you know, if we can reduce the weight in the air, then we're reducing, uh, you know, pollution and everything like that. Very so, true. Very true. Yeah. That yeah, there's... Super cool, man. I see all that. Keep going forward. It's just crazy. You know, it's kind of out, you know, it's, as one barrier gets broken down, you know, it's a whole floodwaters of innovation then it's to find the next it's just crazy what's happening though it seems to be going so fast uh, oh man it's it is it's it's really crazy how how fast things are picking up it's so awesome to be Mm -hmm. you know kind of involved and um and and actually i you know for the most part i don't quite consider myself that involved (laughs) but uh you know just to see what other people are doing and even with uh you know these rocket these rockets that they're 3d printing you know just how they can get these performance out of the rockets that you know we were never able to achieve before um you know that's 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 really the cool part Mm -hmm. so but yeah i i guess um yeah from and then you know i'm still on the other side of that and or you know on the same topic of the industrial side is the um you know the time to market you know you're not having to go through a pattern maker just to get your parts anymore, you know, or have it machined from a solid block of, you know, 12, a 12 inch cube of aluminum, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So, um, Great you know, sense. that's the beauty of, of casting is it doesn't matter what shape you're starting at, you know, it doesn't matter what shape your stock material is, you know, you don't have to wait mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. get your stock material from McMaster car. You, you know, all I have is a, a tub full of grain that I just dump into the casting machine comes out whatever shape I need it to. Yeah, we should, we should get stickers saying like "death of lead time." Yep. <laughs> manufacturing. Yeah, that's that's so great. Um, so I guess overall, then with your experience in three D printing, you know, you obviously get a lot of experience uh, with three D printing and with casting and whatnot. Do you have any tips or tricks that you're willing to share with the with the listeners? Uh, no, I try and keep them all locked up. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm, I'm actually kind of an open book, but uh, I I need to get better at sharing. But um, yeah, I would say um, just let your creativity flow. I mean, like we were talking about, once you kind of get exposed to this and you're like, oh, you can do that and just kind of just let it snowball. That, those are the best conversations I love having is just with other creative people talking about making stuff. And it's just, you know, just no boundaries conversation where you're just, oh, we can go this and oh, then we can toss this in here and oh, we can toss this. And then, but, you know, um, you know, just have those conversations, find those, find those really collaborative people and just, you know, latch onto them and just bounce ideas off them constantly. I love doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And uh, as far as just running machines, um, don't be afraid to mess up your machine. <laughs> I, um, I think I flooded my form labs like the third print I did with it just because I was trying to like print a really big part with little supports. And mm. um, yeah, it just got stuck to the build tray and flung resin all over the inside of the machine. So, um, you know, I, I, you know, I try and be daring with my prints. I, um, I, you know, I try and try and orient things as best as possible and, you know, for minimal supports. And then even then I try and still dial down the supports from there. Um, um, yeah, that's, no, that's, uh, that's, that's some great points that you made there. Cause like, that's one of the things I think with 3d printing is really breaking loose here. Um, and as you said, you're an engineer and, you know, and going through school, they, they teach you all these methods that are, um, within the pre context, right. Of certain limitations, uh, within machining or, or the work that you can do oftentimes. And I feel like that's just kind of like, it's going to be a while I feel until, um, that you know, the way a lot of engineers or machinists or people are taught, it kind of includes, um, 3d printing. It's kind of like almost have to be a total, um, uh, mindset shift in a sense of when, when you uh, work with 3d printing versus working with machining or machine shops and stuff like that. So I think it's a, yeah, it's just a great point. It's kind of like letting the creativity, rethinking problems in a totally different, in a totally different means. And then also, yeah, being daring. I feel like a lot of 3d printers, they can handle a lot. Uh, when, it, when you, especially FDMs, it seems to be, you know, I mean, nothing breaks, seems to break too crazily. Uh, yes. Melt the plastic everywhere. This is Oh my too. goodness. I've had that happen so many times. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't, I can't, I can't tell you how many times. Plastic. Oh my goodness. Balls of plastic, nests of plastic, mm -hmm. um, shavings of plastic, plastic yeah. mixed with grease mixed with, oh, There's no end. Yeah, it's, it's like, nuts. <laughs> yeah. You're like, how did this happen? Yeah. Like, how is this actually possible? Yeah, it's like when wires get tangled. I was like, how is this possible? Same thing for me. How? Yeah. Yes. Well, that's in closing. It's, uh, thank you so much for hopping on the podcast today. This is an absolutely awesome conversation uh, about 3D printing and, and your experience thus far and casting. This is so cool to learn about all this. Um, for our listeners, um, how can they learn more about you and what you do? Um, so I, uh, I just recently launched a website actually, and it's, uh, it's, it's Costello uh, Costello MFG dot com. And that's, uh, C A S T E L O. There's only one L everybody gets hung up with two, but yeah, C A S T E L O M F G dot com. And, uh, this is purely by accident, but when you look at it, it looks like Castell omfg.com <laughs> so you know awesome. once i re one, i think it was my wife that pointed that out and i was like ah, i kind of like it let's roll with it <laughs> <laughs> Character for the name yeah that's really cool yeah i'll, I'll definitely uh, put them in the show notes and uh when we should post this out to everywhere and, and let people know because this is this is really cool and it sounds like you're doing really great stuff with casting um, so yeah once again Thank you so much for, for hopping on. Uh, this is a fantastic conversation. Yeah, no, thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for, uh, you know, thanks for thinking of this podcast. I, you know, I listened to the first, um, first uh, couple episodes and uh, yeah, it's just like, man, like, I, I don't know if I just haven't been paying attention, if there's other stuff like this, or you guys are just, you know, the, the first ones to be doing this kind of stuff. So I was just like, oh yeah, why isn't this a thing? So yeah, thank um, you. Yeah. yeah, no, it's really cool. And I, yeah, it's really neat just to hear just a all around picture of just kind of, you know, the state of what's going on. Mm -hmm. That's our goal. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode of The Next Layer, a podcast for all things 3D printing. If you really enjoyed this episode, we ask that you please share it with all your friends, subscribe and leave us a review. Thanks again for tuning in and we hope to see you at the next.